Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm the book guy and I'm in the middle of our monthly theme of Discovery December, looking at fantasy books that are set outside of the common European location. Today we're looking at the Devabar trilogy by Shannon Chakraborty. This is set in a Middle Eastern Arabian world of magic and jinn. It's a little like Aladdin, yes, in that a poor orphan finds a genie and there is a fight for a throne. Except this story does not have any Disney magic. This is a much more adult series. The djinn here are tricksters capable of great cruelty. The fight for the throne here is much more like Game of Thrones rather than Disney. And the city of Davibard is a powder keg of different people groups who all hate each other and are living in close proximity. As always, I'm going to pitch this book to you spoiler free. I'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses to help you decide if you want to read it. And quick little note, it is pouring rain here and thunderstorm because I live in Brisbane, Australia, and we're in the middle of a cyclone. Damn it. Well, that sucks. No! <laughs> oh, you threw off my groove! Two hours later. And we're back. <laughs> Rain, hell, or shine, the book guy is here for you to help you find a book to read. <laughs> Alright, let's look at the David Bud trilogy. Let's go. Nari is a young woman living on the streets of 18th century Cairo, Egypt. She's an orphan and she's learned how to con people to survive. One day she accidentally summons a djinn. 10,000 years! No, 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 not that kind of djinn. This djinn is called, wait for it, Dara Yavahush i Afshin. Wow! Now, did the thunder just go at the same time as saying that guy's name? That was pretty good. <laughs> That happens a lot around here. Don't worry, you can call him Dara for short, and the book does. Now, Dara recognizes that Nari must have some Deva magic in order to summon him, which means she's not merely human. So the two form an untrusting alliance and begin a perilous journey to travel to Devabad, the city of the Devas, so that Nari can find her heritage and learn about her magic. Meanwhile, living in Devabad already is Prince Alizad, and yes, you can call him Prince Ali. Prince Ali, fabulous he, Ali Ababwa. Ali is stricken by the plight of the people in his city. Devabad has many types of peoples. The lowest of the low is the Shafit, half Deva, half human. You filthy little mob blood. The city is filled with hate crimes and brewing tensions. Prince Ali is determined to find a solution and bring peace. Unfortunately, his father Ghassan is convinced that tensions can only be squashed by brute force and extreme punishment. The king's tough but fair approach doesn't sit right with Ali, who believes there must be a better way. Yet all these tensions will explode if Nari and Dara successfully reach the city and if the secrets they carry are revealed. <laughs> This world is a fantasy version of a very real historical Middle East. To put it simply, this is Islamic culture. The author herself is a Muslim, specifically a white convert to Islam. So this series has a high degree of accuracy on Islamic culture. This is a story we don't see much of in the Western world, so it's beautifully unique for many of us. I'll also state this up front, the book does talk a lot about religion, but it is not a religious book. This is not going to preach to you. One of the protagonists, Prince Ali, is a devout Muslim, so most of the religious themes come through him and are explored through his arc. I'd say he's probably one of my favourite uh, religious characters, but I'll come back to that. So most notable here is the language. People and places here are given Arabic names, which means the names are often very long. For example, you might know this actor, Alexander Siddiq. He plays Dr. Bashir on Star Trek Deep Space Nine the best Star Trek. You might recognize him from this meme. Even the lies, especially the lies. You might be surprised to know that Alexander Siddiq is actually a stage name he chose for himself. His real name is this. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. But as you can see, it's pretty long. And this is actually very common in Islamic culture. This is something we will see all through the Devabad trilogy, where people actually have very long names. It can be a little bit hard to pronounce, and that is when the author very kindly gives us a shorter version. Like Dara Yavahush becomes Dara. 
Thanks for that. This trilogy also uses Middle Eastern folklore, which is something that many in the Western world are unfamiliar with. It's similar to The Witcher, where it's a totally different folklore to what we're used to, therefore anything could happen. Oh, there's a monster in the darkness? It could be any type of monster. So keeping with Middle Eastern folklore, many of the creatures in this world are actually spirits that took physical form. Fire spirits, water spirits, as well as wind and earth. You can see where I'm going? Water. So the four elements play a big role in this story, in the world building and in the magic. It's a common theme you'll see a lot, the Davids themselves have different magic that's based around those four elements. Now before I talk about plot and character, I want to explain the fictional history of the Devabad trilogy. You'll see why in just a minute. <laughs> Devabad has six tribes that live in there, and there's a bunch of strange monsters outside the city. There are different ruling families and different magics. It's a bit hard to understand how they all fit together and where they're all placed on the social hierarchy, so I want to outline the in-world history a little bit for you. The Deva were creatures of spirit and fire. They were immortal and powerful, and they existed long before humans did. Now when the humans were created, the Devas used to treat them like playthings, tricking them, sometimes torturing them and tormenting them, and having half-breed children with them. Eventually, the great prophet Suleiman was chosen by God to restore order. Suleiman created the mighty seal that locked away all magic, a great neutralizer. He gathered all the David together and said, serve me in penance for your crimes, or I will remove your magic forever. Now some denied him and became the cursed Ifrit. More monsters than people at this point. But the majority served him for a time and they built the city of Devabad as their penance. When the city was complete, Suleiman gave them back their magic, but somewhat limited. The Devas are now confined to human bodies. They lived for centuries, not millennia. Suleiman passed on his power to the Nahids, and they became the ruling royals. The Nahids told all Devas to just stay away from the humans to avoid any more trouble. Now, some Devas actually began to travel and interact with the humans, even adopting their ways and raising families together. Their children are called Shafit, you know, low blood or half blood. These Devas started calling themselves Jinn adopting the name that the humans had given them. So just note, Davis and Jin are the same species, but if someone calls themselves Jin, it basically means they are pro-human, where if someone calls themselves Deva, they're, well, a little bit more pure-blooded loyalists. We have a very different idea about what disgraces the name of wizard, Malfoy. Clearly. The Nahids began to crack down on the Jinn, even eventually committing mass killings of Jinn and their offspring in order to repurify the bloodline. This eventually led to a revolution and the Kartani family overthrew the Nahids and killed off most of that line. The Kartani still rule today, centuries later. So this is why Devabad is such a tense place, with so much political unrest. There are six different tribes of people living within Devabad, sort of divided by their branch of magic. Within these tribes, are more subgroups of people who call themselves Devas or Jinn. There are those who are loyal to the Khatanis and those who kind of secretly wish the Nahids would come back. There are pure-blooded Devas and low-blooded Shafit. And everyone hates each other and thinks that they themselves are the only ones who deserve to live in Devabad. This is one of the best examples I've ever seen of a fictional city dealing with civil unrest. Every group thinks they are the ones who are victimized. They think I'm the noble group, I'm the best group, and everyone else is the bad guy. Not to mention the fact that there's centuries of history behind the present tensions. It's so realistic. No one can just move on from the pain of the past. Let's not bicker and argue about who killed who. Now that you have some background context, let's look at the plot lines of this series. So there are two major plot types in Devabad. The first is the adventure plot. So our main girl Nari is on a journey across a fantasy landscape of historical Arabia to reach the city of Brass. We're going on an epic quest. Mission. Quest. Thank you. 
The second major plot type is more of a Game of Thrones type scenario, where everyone is politicking and backstabbing and fighting for control and dominion over the population. And you know what, I'm just gonna say it. There is a third plot line, the city of Davabad itself, if you count the city as a plot line. It's five, five if you count, count the city of New York, York, yes. The ups and downs, the times of peace and the times of conflict, it's its own character and its own plot line. Davabad has a personality of its own. So let's break it down further. The adventure plot line is all about exploring this unique fantasy world. This is where we see all the strange magical creatures from Arabian folklore. The best part is all three of these books have some element of the adventure plot line. Each quest builds on the last one, so that by the end of it, the magic of this world is so well realized. So many mysteries and new ideas, and some pretty wild concepts too. The second plot of the politicking is by far where the majority of the time is spent in this series. And it's good. There's a lot of powerful, influential figures vying for control over the city. They make alliances with each other and then betray those alliances. They play off each other in really clever ways. And sometimes all order breaks down, personal relationships fall apart with huge consequences. The genius of this plotline is that it is so closely linked to the characterization. If someone has a good character arc, it impacts the politics in a positive way. If someone fails in their character arc, there will be far-reaching consequences. This is one of the ways the author gets us extra invested in the characters. One of my favourite parts of the politics plotline here is that stuff is constantly changing and moving forward. So many books are I've read have a politics plotline that just go around and around in circles. It's meant to be intriguing, but it's actually boring, because nothing changes. But that's not the case for Davabad. Each political move changes something on the chessboard and affects what others are doing too. The landscape is barreling forward at incredible speed. Each move increases the tension and drives us closer to that blow up where all the dominoes start to fall. And that third plot of the city itself. At any given point in time, we have an idea of the mood of the city. We feel it when things are escalating. We are aware of the hopes and the fears of the people. I really appreciate this because often when a story has a battle for the throne, the common folk are just background details. We don't know or care much about the people of King's Landing in Game of Thrones. What's their quality of life like? Don't worry about it. Generally speaking, that's just not a part of the story. But in Davabad, we are aware of the plight of the common folk and it adds real stakes to the story. <laughs> So the main trait of these characters is flaws. These are very flawed characters. Now this is a different type of story to having morally grey characters like Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad. And it's different to conflicted characters like you get in superhero or Disney films. Instead, flawed characters have good intentions and bad executions. They have weaknesses that they're not aware of and they make mistakes. Now yes, flawed characters can sometimes be very frustrating to read from. It's like watching characters in a horror movie choosing to go into the woods alone or trying to explore that dark shed for absolutely no reason. But flawed characters are also the most realistic, whether we want to admit that to ourselves or not. Flaws are what makes us human. Or houses. <laughs> Flaws get... Some of these characters have arcs which are all about discovering their flaws and learning how to overcome them. Other characters don't care about their flaws, or they just want to find an excuse or someone else to blame for their problems. I love this message here. The issue is not whether or not we have flaws. The issue is how we deal with them. And that's what decides our quality. So let's look at these characters and note this will explain a lot about the politicking plot lines. I'm also excited to be sharing today artwork by the incredible Math, who did character arc for each of these people. I'm using it today with their permission. Their work is marvellous and you should definitely check out their Instagram which is in the description for the video. Our first character is Nari, she is our number one character. Now look, I feel bad for saying this but I need to critique her immediately. I know, I just said that <laughs> these are great characters. Yet our main character, Nari, is the least interesting character in the story. So this is a Harry Potter type protagonist, where Harry Potter himself is the least interesting person in the story with the least amount of personality because we, the reader, are Harry Potter. So that's the type of viewpoint character that Nari is. That said, she's not totally devoid of personality at all. Her arc is all about knowing who she really is and finding her place in the world. She's a great main character and easy to cheer 
fearful, and her ability to lie and con makes her genuinely fantastic and deeper as well, but she's just surrounded by so many far more interesting characters with better arcs. Like for example her Jin companion. So Dara Yavahush E Afshin. Dara. Dara is probably the most three-dimensional character in the series, and he's a real piece of work. So first, he's under some sort of curse. We don't know what exactly or who put it on him. He's dark and brooding and even charming on the surface. Underneath that, he is just full of contradictions. He hates himself. Yet he never blames himself for his actions. He longs to be free from his Jin curse, and yet he's fiercely loyal to his captors. And eventually we see his awful past, the terrible things he did, and the terrible things done to him. As a side note, Dara is a fan favourite, but kind of for the wrong reasons. You see, David Bard is marketed as a young adult series, which I strongly disagree with, I don't think it is, but I'll talk about that later. Now, David Bart has a high number of young adult readers, and many of them intensely romanticize Dara. They love him and they want him to get the girl, and it's a bit icky, because Dara is obviously not a good person. He's a fascinating character, and I really love his chapters because they're very well written, but he is not a loving partner. I want to go on record of just saying, if you love this guy, you should call your therapist. Therapy. It's like people who watch the Phantom of the Opera and think that the murdering, manipulative Phantom deserves to get the girl at the end. Like, I'm not the biggest fan of Raoul, but he never killed or kidnapped anyone. I'm getting off topic. So now we'll look at the three members of the royal court of the Quantani family, starting with King Ghassan. Okay, now we're really talking about flawed characters. Ghassan is trying to maintain order in a tense situation. His methods are brutal. He wants to maintain order through brute force and displays of power. He has moments of cruelty to his own people and moments of abuse towards his own family. Yet Ghassan genuinely believes that he is helping. He even helps other protagonists from time to time with their own goals. So this proves that he is capable of good. I want to call this guy a villain, but the label is misleading. He's a bad dude, but a villain? Let me emphasize this. Ghassan is one of the most well-written villain characters I've ever read. He's truly very nuanced and complicated. He's so brilliantly flawed and so unaware of it. Muntandir, I think that's how his name's pronounced, is the first prince and the heir apparent. Muntandir is determined to follow in his father's footsteps and be a strong leader. He's a bit of a clone of his father at first, copying his father's cruelty. He follows his father's wishes in every area except one. He still hasn't married or produced an heir of his own. It's a curious exception. Also, Muntandir works very closely with the captain of the guards and his personal bodyguard, Jamsid. The two are very close and are definitely just roommates. Also, Jamsid becomes a major character later on in the series too. And Ali Zard. Okay, last character. Ali is the number two protagonist of the series. He is a devout Muslim, and that is a large part of his plotline. So Ali is heartbroken by the tension in the city and by his father's cruel methods. Ali is much more idealistic and noble. He wants to fix everything and help everyone. Unfortunately, his idealism makes him naive and inexperienced. Ali, particularly at the start, has pure intentions, yet is almost stupid in his methods. Fair warning, many fans say that he is the most frustrating character. Yet Ali becomes very devoted to improving himself. He's a lawful good character who becomes aware of the weaknesses and even the dangers of being lawful good. So he works hard to balance himself better. He knows if he can win the internal battle, he can make a bigger difference for all. In that sense, Ali works harder at self-improvement than anyone else. Ali is also the primary victim of his father's cruelty. He loves his father and is devoted to him, yet cannot distinguish between his father the king and his father the abuser. Ali struggles to learn the lessons his father is teaching, even while trying to break free of his control. Okay, now let's discuss the elephant in the room. Oh, Jesus Christ. Literally. <laughs> David Bard has some pretty intense parallels to the real world. After all, David Bard is a type of Jerusalem, an ancient holy city that's important to a whole bunch of people for different reasons, and everyone thinks they're the only ones who deserve to have it. The similarities continue. Different peoples have different beliefs and different gods, and people are willing to commit atrocities because they believe they have a right to do it. Either a divine right or a hereditary right to commit genocide. Look, I'm not going to commentate on the real world situation any further than I kind of already am, but I do want to point out that this is why it's important to read books, especially to read fiction. 
When we read fiction, we explore complex ideals from our real world. We look at these complex situations and learn how to understand them better through the lens of the hypothetical. Most of all, we learn empathy from reading. We learn that there are real people in every conflict and everyone has a story as unique as our own. This is one of the reasons why I want to introduce more people to this trilogy, because it will improve people's understanding and empathy of a present situation. I believe knowledge and education are the greatest tools we have to fight darkness in this world. In short, the pen is mightier than the sword. Reading a book today may not solve today's problems, but it will equip you and others like you to handle the problems of tomorrow. Uh, I nearly didn't include this segment, I just get so frustrated by this topic. Apparently that's a trigger for me. Yeah, apparently. The David Bard trilogy is considered YA. And that just makes no sense at all to me. It's not a YA series. I mean, you heard all that stuff about civil unrest, hate crimes, and politics. Does that sound very YA? Not exactly. I believe this is marketed at YA because the protagonist is young, there's a bit of a love triangle, and because the author is a woman. As I mentioned in my Poppy War video last week, there's a huge tendency in the publishing industry to market male authors as high fantasy and female authors as YA, regardless of what story they're telling. But that's just publishers trying to sell books, and not a reflection of who the stories are for. I don't think YA is bad at all. It's meant to serve a purpose of breeding new readers into the genre. In fact, I'm planning on doing doing a whole monthly theme of YA in January to celebrate young readers and invite more people to the genres of fantasy and science fiction. But I don't think it's fair to label something as YA when it really isn't, especially when it's just done out of bias. So if you're put off by the YA label, don't worry, you can still read David Bard because it's not YA. But second, YA still deserves more respect from the book community. <laughs> Both of those two things are true at the same time. Well, as you would expect from Discovery December, there is a massive amount of representation for race and culture. Everyone is a person of colour. That's why I wanted to include Matt's wonderful artwork because that might occlude you into that fact. Gender rep is kind of strange though. This is a female author with a female lead character, so we might think, oh, this will be pretty feminist, right? Yet, women are strangely lacking from this story. Nari is just about the only main woman. There are many other women, but they're also quite one-dimensional. It just rarely happens where women talk to other women. There is a lot of representation for Islam and for religion in general. For one, the great prophet Suleiman is very much a Muhammad-type figure. Also, Prince Ali is a depiction of a religious person trying to do better. Trying to do better. Their faith motivates them to help others and to serve the common good. It's a nice change of pace to the religious villains we often see, who are more focused on how their religion gives them power over others. And there are many discussions about the pros and cons of religion in this series, which are very interesting to explore and quite a well-balanced argument. Also, there is a great LGBT storyline here. I hinted at it earlier, I don't want to spoil it, but there's a story of two men who hide their love for each other. And both of these characters have involvement in the story beyond just their sexual identity. They're allowed to be people as well, not just token characters. Overall, it is a very well done plotline. Bit of a strange content warning for this one, so David Bard is not particularly violent, there's no sex, no swearing, etc. But it is still pretty dark. There are a lot of hate crimes, there is murder of innocents, there are civilians being killed in the wars of the ruling class. All of these dark themes occur with that much graphicness, but it's a sobering topic to see so much of. It adds a lot of tension to the story, and there is real historical accuracy involved. It just sucks to see it, you know? So that's the content warning for this one. Yes, this ending is worth it. This trilogy gets a little bit better with every book. It also gets a little bit darker with every book. I would say book three is the darkest and simultaneously the best. It's also worth noting here that each book is a little longer than the one before. Book three is a pretty chunky one, but there are no low points to the series. Every book is solid in quality. You can read book one and know right away if the series is going to be right for you. But I thought book one was the most YA out of the three. 
And I know I sound like I'm contradicting myself here, but Dave Abad is definitely an adult series in my opinion, but there are slight hints of YA in book one. Uh, specifically, there is the love triangle, a focus on personal relationships, and protagonists trying to find themselves, which are common stories for young adults. It's still a good book and a good sampling of the rest of the series, but I do think books two and three include a lot more of the politicking, the civil unrest, and the big magic. So the more serious topics are explored deeper in. I hope that gives you incentive to enjoy book one, but also read the full story for yourself. I hope you enjoy some happy reading with the Dave Abad trilogy. All right, so that was my pitch for Dave Abad. I genuinely hope more people are inspired to read it and enjoy this great story. If it doesn't sound like it's gonna be the right book for you, don't worry, please check out one of the other videos on my channel and I will find a book that suits you a bit better. Coming up next, I'm finishing Discovery December already uh, with Children of Blood and Bone, uh, technically called the Legacy of Orisha, set in West Africa in a fantasy version of Nigeria. I hope to see you there for that video. You can support the channel by subscribing, interacting with the video in some way, and checking out our shop, Rainbow Space Unicorn, for all of our cutesy merch. Thank you for watching, I'll see you next time, and I hope you enjoy a good book today. Bye! Poor Esme has been jumping around during the storm, she's all startled.